Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to examine uh, realism in art, realism as a style of art. Uh, some artworks are realistic, they aim to represent the world accurately, they, they aim to be objective or true to nature, uh, and it's pretty easy to point to artworks that are more or less realistic. So uh, on the left is a portrait by David Eichenberg, that's highly realist, indeed you'd probably mistake it for a photograph if you weren't told that it's actually a painting, uh, and on the right this is a portrait of Henrietta Moraes by Francis Bacon, that's not remotely realistic. Um, now, so, so some artworks represent reality in a, a realistic and accurate manner. That is the standard view, at least. There are, however, some interesting philosophical challenges to the very idea that some artworks are more realistic, uh, that some artworks represent more uh, reality more truthfully than do others. Um, now, obviously, there is a significant stylistic difference between the David Eichenberg painting and the Francis Bacon painting. The question is whether the David Eichenberg painting provides a more realistic, more faithful uh, representation of its subject. Um, Okay, now before getting into this, a quick advert. I have a Patreon or a PayPal if you wish to support my channel. Um, I also offer private tutoring and I have a Discord server which you can join if you want to talk about this topic or any other philosophical topic with other people. Okay then, let's move on. So the most famous challenge um, to the notion of realism in art comes from uh, Nelson Goodman uh, in his book Languages of Art, and we'll take a look at some of Goodman's arguments in this video. So one issue that's raised by Goodman concerns the uh, selection of features that we want an artwork to represent. So suppose that I want to create a portrait of Frank Zappa. If my aim is to create a realistic portrait, then I will need to create something that is uh, as close a copy of Frank Zappa as possible. But what exactly is Frank Zappa? I mean, what so what is it that I am trying to create a copy of? Um, so the first point Goodman makes here is that there's many ways of, you know, taking or classifying Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa is a cloud of atoms. Frank Zappa is a complex of cells. He's a person, a musician, a father, a satirist, um, and so on and so on. Frank Zappa has a huge range of different features. There's a, there's a number of different things that Frank Zappa is. Now, obviously, I can't include all of these characteristics and the indefinite other characteristics associated with Frank Zappa in my portrait. You know, I can't create a portrait that, that, that sort of brings out the fact that Frank Zappa is a cloud of atoms and the fact that Frank Zappa is a musician and the fact that Frank Zappa is a satirist and the fact that he's a father and so on. I, I mean, I can't do that. Or at least if I did create a portrait that um, kind of made salient all of these things, it would surely not be a realistic portrait by any normal standard. So the question is, which of these things do I select in order to create a realistic portrait? Which of these things is the way that Frank Zappa really is? And I mean, the obvious problem here is, well, he's all of these ways. So one problem with realistic representation is the selection of relevant features. For any object, there are a variety of ways of understanding and classifying the object, and you might attempt to uh, to sort of make salient any of these in an artistic representation of the object. So the, the, the question is, well, which of these features constitutes a realistic representation? Now, I suppose the usual assumption is that the point of realistic art is to capture the way that an object looks to us. So what we would want to say is that the David Eichenberg painting looks like its subject, and the Francis Bacon painting does not look like its subject. One way to think of this is in terms of um, photographic illusion. So the realistic painting, as we mentioned, could easily be mistaken for a photograph. Um, you know, when, when you looked at those paintings earlier, you might have thought that the painting on the left, the Eichenberg painting, you might have thought, oh, that's a photograph. You'd be wrong. Uh, now, the problem is, at this point, we just sort of push the problem one step back, because now we have to ask, well, what exactly constitutes a realistic photograph? Um, the way that a photograph looks will depend on the functioning of the camera and any further editing or manipulation of the image. A scene can be photographed in a variety of ways. There is, there is no one way that a scene will look in a photograph. Consider, for instance, astrophotography. Um, 
uh, astrophotographers use image processing to reveal differences in the proportions of elements, for instance, that would be hidden um, in other types of photographs. So here are two photographs of the pillars of creation from the Eagle Nebula. One is uh, on the left processed from visual light, the other from infrared light. Um, and here finally is the true color image. Uh, um, so, you know, like uh, even, even the image that's like processed from visual light is uh, going to uh, be processed in such a way that it's like bringing out far more distinctions than are shown in true color. And actually even this true color photograph is taken using a long exposure. This would be nowhere near as vibrant if it was seen with the naked eye. You know, if you were, if you were to travel close to the Eagle Nebula or look at it through a telescope or something, you, um, it would appear as faint white clouds. Um, so, okay, there's, so, so like photographs can look all sorts of different ways. There's no such thing as, you know, a, a, a kind of unfiltered photograph, as it were, uh, like a photograph that just captures things as, as they are without uh, processing. There's always going to be some processing in the camera that affects the image that's produced. Um, so there's what we can say is, well, there's there's more or less conventional means of processing. Even if we consider um, what you might think of as like a, a normal photograph, um, well, this will just capture an instant. It captures the subject at a specific place and time. And then you can still ask, well, what about all the other relevant features of the subject? It might be that I could capture a person's attitude far better in, you know, some sort of, maybe I take a photograph and then I manipulate it to make it look more like a caricature. Um, or if I'm photographing a landscape, maybe I, I should edit the photo in some way um, to, to capture the emotional impact of being in the landscape. So the question is, it still has to be raised, well, why exactly is it that capturing the visual appearance of an object at a particular instant is what counts in terms of realistic representation? In fact, interestingly, even if you just look at it in terms of the immediate visual appearances, um, these often do not translate well to photography. Um, Goodman uh, has this nice little quote where he says, there's nothing like a camera to make a molehill out of a mountain. And this is, I mean, if you've ever tried to take photographs of things, you've probably noticed this. Many times, you know, I'll, I'll see a landscape that looks absolutely stunning to the eye, and then I take a photo of it on my phone. I mean, I'm not a professional photographer, right? So I just put the phone up, I take an image, I snap a shot, and uh, I mean, the photo sucks. Like the object, uh, you know, if it, like the mountains just look far less impressive. So any object in the distance, somehow when you take a photo of it, it looks smaller, not just in terms of, um, you know, like absolute size, obviously, but like in terms of the relative size, it just, the camera just doesn't capture it. Um, still, I suppose we have um, an important criterion here. This, this discussion suggests an important criterion for realistic art. Realistic art um, is supposed to represent the way the object looks to the normal eye under normal conditions. Now, of course, when I say this, this invokes a bunch of philosophical assumptions. I mean, if that's supposed to be realistic art, then the assumption there is that the eye is accurate. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's highly controversial. But, <clears throat> you know, OK, the thought is, look, in creating a representation of an object, I must select some features of the object to represent. And if I want to create a realistic representation, the feature that I select is the way the object looks to the normal eye under normal conditions. The reason why photographs are seen as being realistic um, is because, you know, at least in the case of normal photography, it seems like photographs do this, right? Photographs seem to capture the way an object looks to the normal eye under normal conditions. Goodman uh, invokes the metaphor uh, of the innocent eye. So he says the aim of realistic art is to give the view of the innocent eye. Um, the aim is to show, as Goodman puts it, the way the object looks to the normal eye at proper range from a favourable angle in good light without instrumentation, unprejudiced by affectations or animosities or interests and unembellished by thought or interpretation. Uh, now, I mean, <laughs> OK, so we've just given a whole bunch of different qualifications and conditions there. Why do we need all of these conditions? Well, let's say that I give a totally faithful representation of the visual appearance of Frank Zappa as seen by a drunkard in a snowstorm from a great distance on a road lit by dim sodium vapour street lamps. 
Well, I mean, you know, I mean, is that a realistic representation of Frank Zappa? I mean, maybe we would judge it to be a realistic representation of the experience of a destitute drunkard, but you probably wouldn't call it a realistic depiction of Frank Zappa. So, so here's the general problem. Without the perspective specified, an object, any object, can appear pretty much any way whatsoever. So take any object and try moving it very close to your eyes. Well, what will happen as you move it really close to your eyes is that it will consume your entire visual field and it will become a sheet of uh, what's called intrinsic grey, the kind of um, very, very dark grey that appears when you close your eyes. So a painting of Frank Zappa, which is drawn, drawn from the perspective of somebody kissing Frank Zappa, that wouldn't show any of his distinctive features or, or you know, the features usually associated with Frank Zappa. Um, it, it would, maybe it would just be like this sheet of intrinsic grey. Or try looking at an object in unusual lighting conditions, or looking at it using, you know, a set of curved mirrors, or looking at it through a special Snapchat filter. Um, with the right transformations, an object can appear as almost anything. Here's a painting by Elizabeth Patterson. Now, initially, you look at that and it seems really abstract, but it's actually a photorealistic painting of a city street as seen through a wet windshield. Um, and it, I mean, it is right. Like when you re when you when you realise that's what's being painted, it's like, oh yeah, wow, that really is a a strikingly realistic um, uh, image that she has created there. Um, <clears throat> so the innocent eye is not the non perspectival eye. We are always looking at objects from one perspective or another. But now the ob obvious question is, well, which perspective counts as the realistic perspective? Um, so, you know, when, when I create a supposedly realistic representation, so, so to say that, like, some representation is a realistic representation, I have to be sort of privileging a particular type of perspective on the object. I have to be privileging one perspective on the object among many. Um, but, but any perspective on an object will reveal a way that the object looks. So the sheet of intrinsic grey that really is a way that Frank Zappa looks. But you wouldn't take that as a realistic depiction of Frank Zappa. I mean, you, you, in fact, some people might say that's not a, de you know, if I showed you just like a sheet of grey, um, you'd say, well, that's not a depiction of Frank Zappa at all. Um, so, so this is one problem, right? Like, okay, this, this innocent eye isn't really innocent. It's, you know, what you, what you see with, you know, the naked eye under normal conditions, etc. That is one perspective among many. Um, so a further issue with the notion of the, the innocent eye is that we cannot help but bring our interpretations to what we see. As Goodman says, normal perception selects, rejects, organises, discriminates, associates, classifies, analyses, constructs. So for two people looking at the same scene, very different objects will be salient. Indeed, they might not recognise the same objects at all. Let's say that a person from a, a small-scale uh, society in the Amazon um, is is taken to my room and he, he views my room. Now much of what he sees will be incomprehensible to him. Um, you know, the, so like the computer. The computer is a very important object to me. That will not be salient to him at all. Indeed, he might not even recognise a single unified object here. Um, and, and where I see, you know, a table, something which uh, serves to prop up objects like the computer, he sees firewood, something to be chopped up and used. Um, now, we can't, you know, it, it seems like we, it, we can't remove this kind of background understanding and view the scene as it really is independent of interpretation. Experience without interpretation would be, uh, in the words of William James, a, a blooming, buzzing confusion. Even if you just try to um, describe things merely in terms of, like, uh, colours, you know, you say, well, there's a patch of black here and a patch of red there. There's not going to be... Um, universal agreement on that because different societies have different colour languages. They they carve up the colour uh, colours in different ways. Um, so uh, what what does this mean? Well any artistic representation of the of the scene will inevitably mirror the uh, the artist's eye. Um, so if I was to paint my room, the computer would be salient. Um, now, I wouldn't, I mean, you know, maybe I wouldn't draw attention to the computer in the painting, but, you know, if I'm not drawing attention to it, I'm sort of 
going to be intentionally focusing elsewhere. I mean, the computer is just like an object that kind of strikes me. It's important to me. And so if I'm painting my room, I have to make a decision about like how to deal with that object. Do I represent, do I sort of, you know, show the salience of the computer or do I, um, you know, do I try to avoid it? On the other hand, if you were to ask the visitor from, you know, the small scale Amazonian society to paint the room, they would approach the task quite differently because, you know, computer, the object computer just isn't something that's part of their conceptual repertoire. It's not something that is, you know, is going to be either constructed or deconstructed within the painting. Um, okay, then. So, you know, so the innocent eye, uh, Goodman says, um, that's that's a myth. Um, but, you know, I mean, we might say, look, uh, there's still a way of, of sort of making sense of realistic art here. Um, there's still a way of saving realism. And this is to be found in the, the objectivity of perspective. Um, so consider a motionless object. Again, take my computer. Now, suppose you have a picture of this computer, which is drawn in correct perspective. Well, the idea is that the picture of the computer will reflect light in such a way that the light rays reaching the eye match the light rays from the computer itself. So the, the picture of the computer and the computer itself will create the same visual appearances in the audience. And this matching of light rays is objective. I mean, we can use instruments to check it. And so, I mean, surely you'd say, well, that's that's as clear a case of realistic depiction as we could ask for. Now, obviously, different people will interpret this image in different ways. Different people will see different things in the image depending on their background knowledge. I will, you know, like I'm going to see if you if it's a picture of a computer, then I'm going to see more in that image than a person from a, a small scale society will. But whatever is seen in the image is also going to be seen in the computer itself. Because again, the, the, the point is, right, we have this object, the computer, we have the picture of the computer and the the visual appearance of the computer and the visual appearance of the picture of the computer are, in the ideal case, they are identical. And we can objectively measure that these appearances will be identical because we can objectively measure the matching of the light rays from the computer and the picture of the computer. So isn't this, you know, that gives us the kind of ideal case of realist art, doesn't it? Well, even here, Goodman points out a number of problems. So, first of all, notice that for this scenario to work, we need to have very precise conditions of observation. Um, so, in order for this to work, to get the light rays to match, um, the picture and the object need to both be viewed through a peephole and from a specific angle and distance with, with, one, eye with one eye closed. If you view with both eyes, then that's going to reveal that the painting is flat. The light rays aren't going to match. So you have to get one eye through a peephole. And then, of course, you have to set the, the angle and, and the distance and so on. And, and often the angle and the distance are going to be different for the painting and the object. I mean, if I'm painting a very large object, like if I'm painting not a computer, but a building, then the actual object will have to be viewed from a very great distance and probably from a raised platform or something. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to get the light rays to match. Um, it's also clear that, you know, I mean, so if the observer sort of, moves at all the light rays will fail to match it so it, it has to be um like it has to be through a peephole or again it immediately becomes clear that the image is flat so okay suppose we set up these observational conditions well the first problem is that under these conditions what is observed will um tend to fade away it will fade to gray um normal vision requires constant motion of the eyes uh so i mean you can try this yourself select a spot and just stare at it, holding your gaze fixed. And the scene will sort of fade, fade to grey. And that effect is going to be even more pronounced in the sort of setup that we've just described. So, it, OK, we have an experiment which gives us an identity of light rays reaching the eyes. And yet in that experiment, the eye is blinded. Um, so I mean, it's a realistic image, but it's one that can only be glanced rather than appreciated artistically. Um, there's something kind of odd about that. A second issue here is that it would make it impossible to interact with certain kinds of art. So consider, for instance, Chinese landscape paintings. Um, on the above is a, a section of a painting by Wang Zimeng. Below is a painting by Zhao Bujou. 
Chinese landscape paintings are often very, very large. Um, well, maybe not often, but some of them at least are very, very large. Uh, so, you know, the uh, the first painting uh, 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 on the previous slide, for instance, I think that's something like, you know, 10 metres long by one metre high. And you're supposed to view these paintings in sections. You walk across the image in much the sort of way that you would read a scroll. You kind of cast your eyes from from right to left because that's how it, you know, that's the direction it would be read in that society. Um, now, obviously, this makes it impossible to use linear perspective. There can be no fixed vanishing point in the painting and there's no single privileged vantage point from which the artwork is viewed. But it's not obvious why this should be judged as necessarily unrealistic. So the thought of this type of artwork is, well, you're supposed to uh, kind of wander around the image and allow yourself to be immersed in it. And that's kind of similar to how you are immersed in nature. I mean, isn't that in some sense more real? That's a more realistic experience than, you know, viewing an image through a peephole with one eye closed. Um, so, you know, I mean, like, again, it seems like there's some important sense in which, like, this provides a kind of realism which is just completely inaccessible in the sort of setup that um, that we've described. Now, the third issue then um, is that the observational conditions required to get the light rays to match are, of course, highly artificial. This is not how any of us actually view realistic art, not even in you know the Western tradition where we create things with linear perspective. So consider then that we could similarly set up highly artificial observational situations that would make apparently unrealistic pictures look more realistic. So we could take an image that is drawn out of perspective and then use a special system of lenses to make it appear in perspective. Or we could take an image that is drawn using an unusual colour palette and then use special lighting or glasses or whatever to make the colours appear normal. Um, in none of these cases I suppose, I mean, I, presumably in none of these cases we would, we, would we say that we have a realistic representation. And the reason why it's not realistic is because the viewing conditions are so unusual. When we talk about realism as a style of art, we're not talking about these, like, strange artificial viewing conditions that allow the artwork to deliver the same set of light rays to the eye as the object represented. We're talking... Uh, you know, we're talking of art that is viewed in everyday conditions, you know, looking at a painting in a gallery or on the pages of a book or whatever. Um, and so, you know, so as soon as you sort of say, well, OK, what matters is that the light rays have to match. Well, in order to get the light rays to match, you're always going to require these highly artificial observational conditions. But, as, but once you allow highly artificial observational conditions, um, you can get the light rays of highly unrealistic representations to match the light rays from actual objects. OK, so there's a fourth concern about the idea that realism consists in objective matching of light rays. Um, so think about this. OK, so what's what's happening when we when we draw these um, realistic images is that we're constructing them in linear perspective. And there's an interesting snag here known as Zeeman's paradox. The perspective of a drawing is constructed from a uh, single vantage point. Um, and in order for a drawing that's in perspective to appear identical to the scene that is represented in order for it to deliver matching light rays to the eye, the drawing must be viewed from the vantage point from which the perspective in the drawing is constructed. So if you're considering this from the point of view of like the laws of optics, you would expect that perspective illustrations will appear correct only from a single vantage point. Um, I mean, basically, you would expect that the highly artificial conditions described by Goodman would be required in order to, for, for perspective drawings to appear correct. Only in those conditions do these drawings deliver light rays to the eye that match the light rays from the actual object. But it turns out that even if the image is viewed from other angles, even you know quite highly oblique angles, the perspective still appears correct. I mean, you just try this, right? Just just you know, Google an image, right? Take take an image on your computer screen and then just try moving around, view it from the side or from above. I mean when you view the image side on, it doesn't deliver light rays that would match the light rays of the scene represented. I mean, it doesn't even approximate them, but the the image still registers as realistic. Uh, and this is Zeeman's paradox. Perspective drawings should not appear correct. They should not appear realistic from other angles, but they do. Uh, we have no problem viewing them from other angles. Um, 
Okay, so uh, there are there are several problems then with the notion of realism as as sort of resemblance to nature or imitation of nature or whatever. This of course leaves the question of well, um, I mean, what exactly is the alternative? Uh, is 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 there some way of making sense of the notion of realism, or is this notion just completely incoherent? Well, actually, Goodman says no. We can. Um, make sense of realism, he proposes a conventionalist understanding of realism. So according to Goodman, and I quote, the literal or realistic or naturalistic system of representation is simply the customary one. Um, he goes on to say, that a picture looks like nature often means only that it looks like the way nature is usually painted. So basically what Goodman's saying is that the style of representation that people judge to be realistic or accurate, um, that's simply the style with which we are most familiar and most comfortable. So, you know, somebody in the West who is, you know, like for someone in the West, okay, we're familiar with these sort of paintings, um, sort of mid-sized paintings drawn in linear perspective, so that looks realistic to us. If you talk to somebody who's immersed in Chinese landscape painting, that will look more realistic to them. Um, Okay then, so so Goodman has this sort of purely conventional view of, of realism. Um, so one way to sort of see how this works is to consider two images, right? So in, in this case, we've got two paintings. They're identical, except the colours in the second image are reversed, um, inverted. Now, <clears throat> provided we interpret these images correctly, they will both be taken to convey the same information. Like, so if I ask you, what is it that is depicted in this image? What does this image, like, you know, show us? Um, if we apply the right interpretation, if we understand the artistic symbolism and so on, then in both cases, we're going to get the same information from the image. Um, but you'll notice that we're probably going to say that the image on the left here is more realistic than the image on the right. So on Goodman's view, some sort of translation manual is required for understanding both images. The difference is we are more familiar with the conventions with respect to the first image, so we don't notice the translation manual that we use for that image. So, I mean, think about learning a new symbol system, like learning to read a musical score. At first, you have to consciously translate what is on the page into particular actions that you perform with the instrument. But eventually, after repeated use, you just understand the score as you it, it, the same way that you would understand a native language. Um, use of the symbol system becomes automatic. And Goodman would say, well, in the same way, our interpretation of art can become automatic. So we, are fam we become familiar with certain artistic conventions like linear perspective. Um, and then once we're familiar with that, we easily understand what is depicted, you know, when, when we view an artwork in linear perspective. And, and we can easily kind of obtain information about what is depicted and so linear perspective strikes us as more realistic. So for Goodman, um, realism is just a matter of inculcation into a particular symbol system. Uh, a picture is judged to be realistic when we can readily retrieve information from the picture about the object it represents. Right, The, the information retrieval is, is just automatic because the representational system used by the artwork has become familiar to us. I mean, there are, there are particular means of representation that have become familiar, that have become stereotypical. Those are the realistic representations. Another way to think about this is to say a representational system is realistic when we are no longer aware of it as a representational system, when the interpretation of the representation is just automatic. Um, so we when we engage with artworks that use a familiar representational system, we have the feeling of like seeing through the artwork to the object depicted. And so we're no longer consciously aware that we're engaging in interpretation. And that's when we'll say that an artwork is realistic. The idea here is actually quite similar to Goodman's solution of his uh, new problem of induction. I have a video on Goodman's problem of induction that I will link in the comments. Um, this problem appeals to uh, the idea of unusual predicates such as GRU, where an object is GRU if it is observed before some time and is green, or is observed after that time and is blue. Um, GRU is a perfectly well-defined predicate, but we don't use it in our reasoning about the world. We don't think of any objects as being GRU, even though, I mean, there are plenty of objects that satisfy that predicate. 
Goodman argues that, you know, the the sort of natural predicates, the predicates that we see as picking out natural properties, are simply those predicates that have become well entrenched in our language. So along similar lines, the style of realism, artistic realism, in Goodman's view, is just a matter of entrenchment. So, okay then, before we end, maybe we'll consider uh, a few objections to uh, Goodman's position here. So one issue is that, well, what we today think of as a realistic style, that required a variety of innovations, like linear perspective, that was an innovation. Now, at the time these innovations were made, they were certainly not customary, they were not entrenched, and yet even at the time, they were considered to generate more realistic images. You know, when linear perspective was perfected in the Renaissance, it was quickly adopted as a technique by artists who were interested in realistic representation. So it doesn't seem that any process of inculcation was required. Linear perspective was just, you know, it was developed and then it was just seen as realistic. In fact, even today, it's relatively rare that you encounter photorealistic paintings. Um, I mean, that's why, you know, a lot of people are, will be impressed by such artworks because they're so rare. Um, what's impressive about them is their unusual degree of re realism relative to other paintings. So if realism is just a matter of inculcation, as Goodman uh, says, uh, that's perhaps a bit puzzling. Um, another issue for Goodman's view is that if what matters for realism is just automatic information retrieval, well, it's also the case uh, that we automatically retrieve information when we say things, you know, or when we read things in our native language. Um, propositions in a language are not viewed as realistic representations of anything. So the sentence, the cat is on the mat. That describes a scene and an English speaker will immediately understand what I'm saying. But of course, it's not a realistic representation of the scene. Uh, now, I mean, we might point out that well, the sentence, the cat is on the map, that describes a situation rather than depicts a situation. You know, it's not an artistic depiction. But then that just raises the question, well, why, right? Why do we treat that as mere description rather than as realistic depiction? Because we obtain information from it just as readily as we would from, you know, like a photograph of a cat on a map. Uh, finally, a final problem. Consider developments in art over the last century or so. At this point, many of us have become familiar with, we have become habituated to artistic styles like cubism, say, but cubism still strikes us as unrealistic. Um, you know, even people with an interest in unusual or experimental art, they tend to think that traditions like cubism are not particularly realist. I mean, in, indeed, they're often attracted to these traditions precisely in virtue of the fact that, that these traditions are seen as departing from realistic representation. Um, at one point when he was uh, defending his theory, Goodman quotes Picasso. So um, there's a story that on viewing Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein, some people objected that it, that it did not look like her. And Picasso supposedly responded, no matter, it will. Um, and what Goodman took from this is, well, you know, what, oh, what Picasso is saying is that the conventions of realistic representation will change. And once Picasso's style becomes familiar, once it becomes entrenched, people will judge that the portrait does indeed look like Gertrude Stein. Mm, but that doesn't seem to have happened. Right. Um, you know, we still look at Picasso and think that, uh, I mean, you know, I mean, look, it, it's a lot of people love his work. But even those who love his work don't look at it as being particularly realistic. So although, you know, so yeah, Goodman uh, certainly raises some interesting challenges to the uh, traditional way of thinking about realistic art. His own account of realism as simply a matter of entrenchment, simply a matter of habituation into a particular representational system that has not proven to be so popular. Um, and that is the end of that video. Thank you very much for watching.